My name is Joshua Cohen with Fat Pencil Studio, and today I'm going to talk about our process for building and organizing models for a presentation. Now, what I've got in front of us is a construction logistics model, and I'm going to talk about three parts of our process. The first is creating a base model that will serve as the context for what we're doing then a, adding logistics and phasing information to explain what the process uh, for this construction project will be, and finally talk a little bit about some tips for presenting. So the first thing I wanted to point out is that we start generally with uh, a blocks underlying all the buildings on screen. So I'm going to turn off um, everything except for the block structure so you can see what we're starting with here. This area is the Pearl District, or sometimes called the River District in, in near downtown Portland. And you'll see, you know, we might, some people might say we're looking at the streets, but we actually focus on the blocks, and we'll get that information from Google Earth sometimes. You can see here's a, a Google Earth snapshot that we've captured. Um, there's a, uh, a terrain layer here as well. You can see in this case, the terrain layer is not significantly different from the flat snapshot layer, so we've chosen to stick with a just a flat um, a flat substrate for our model, and then we will add on specific parts of the um, context. So if we started with just the blocks, we then would add the existing buildings, and those are here. These buildings, you can see there's a, a fair amount of detail in those buildings. And part of the reason that that's the case is we were able to capture all of these buildings from Google Earth uh, at the time, which was about two years ago. Now it's not so easy to do that. There are some buildings that are available in Trimble's 3D Warehouse, but not all the buildings in every case. Uh, it's always worth looking, though, on the 3D Warehouse to see if some of the buildings you might need are available. And if we didn't have them uh, available to import, we probably would have just modeled um, real simple buildings like what you're seeing here in yellow. These, these two buildings are just basic massing. These are buildings that were uh, not constructed at the time of the um, project that we were doing, but they're planned for the future. So we have them in there for context. And then we also have here the uh, building that will be demolished to make way for this new project. And one more word about terrain that I wanted to mention. Uh, in some cases, you will have terrain being an important aspect of the project. And I'm going to show you real quick a model that, uh, that, that is the case. This is a model that we built for a project called the Seattle Streetcar. And Seattle's uh, hills, or Seattle's terrain is definitely not flat. And you can see here, we uh, needed to capture all of the terrain for this project. And you can see the uh, street markings and the buildings are all mapped onto the terrain. So let's see if I can move around a little bit in this model, give you a sense for how this is laid out. Our process for this was to first design the, the uh, blocks and, and, and all the markings on a flat surface and then to drape those over the terrain. And that's not something I'm going to get into anymore in this particular video, but you know, know that, that that can be an issue in certain projects, and there are strategies for dealing with that. So I'm going to close this model and get back to the Pearl District. Here we go. And now I'm going to launch into a, a little more detailed discussion about logistics and phasing and how you can use multiple scenes to organize that for our presentation. So the first thing we'll do is talk to a client about what are the key issues in a project. And in this project, we had a, a construction, um, a, uh, well, actually, before I do that, now I'm just remembering, I do want to show you what we're going to build here. So let's just give you a, a sense for what the logistics are that we're going to show, and then I can go back and talk about that. So here's, here's the, uh, the sequence here. We've got a context model, building gets demolished, they need to take, pull the water off the site, 
out before they start excavation. Then their building construction starts and the tower goes up. So this is in general what we're going to be doing today is looking at what's the process for building this tower and what are some of the issues that the construction company will need to explain when they're bidding on the project. And I'm going to show you a few of the things that we got from our client. Here's just a few little uh, items here. This is showing the existing building and how they're talking about demolishing it. Here's this, some notes we got about their process for pulling the water out of the site. They have to do this before they start excavation because it's right close to a river. So there would be a lot of uh, water and, and, and the groundwater they would need to deal with first. Then once they uh, are, have done, are done with that, they've got excavation that occurs and then start with uh, what's called the, uh, the podium, the, the large uh, full block area. And then you can see here they've marked up um, some of our early base model drawings to talk about how they plan to approach the uh, tower structure. Lots of little notes. It's our job to capture these in a very um, clear and nice looking set of diagrams. And we had some information about the building to start. Uh, I mentioned that we rely a lot on Google um, Earth and, 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 and other sources for making the blocks. When it comes to the buildings, uh, we had, in this case, a set of what I would call conceptual design drawings, not a, not a detailed, you know, down to the last wall and door swing, but just conceptual design for the tower. And that included here are the garage levels. This is the podium level. Then it gets up into the uh, tower construction. Here you see the different floors of the tower. So we can import these PDFs into SketchUp and then use that as a template to create the tower that you see here. And the question is how to organize it. So once we know what the key issues are, we've figured out how many uh, scenes or snapshots that we want to create. We've got a, an existing conditions at number zero, a complete scene at number eight. And then the question is what do we need to show in between? And we identified working with a client seven different stages to talk about. So Let's zoom in a little bit and talk about stage one here. This is demolition. And you'll see on the ground we've got some construction fence here. We've got some equipment. And then here's the building that's going to go away, highlighted in, in a sort of reddish pink there. Here's the dewatering phase. Got some more equipment here, a, a drill rig, a mobile office. These two things are baker tanks. And a word about equipment. It would be very time consuming if we had to model each piece of equipment from scratch for every, every project. And so we rely on sort of a library of components that we have built up over the years. Some of those we've actually made available on the 3D warehouse. I can show you what that looks like. If you were to search for a Fat Pencil Studio on a 3D warehouse and, and look at co collections, we've got a construction equipment collection. So here you see the different, um, some different things that we have in the, in the collection. In any case, we've got a bunch of different things. This is a um, crane that we uh, probably is our most interesting model in the collection because it's a dynamic component. And that means you can configure it in a variety of different ways to match different um, needs for a construction site. I can show you what that looks like in SketchUp. Not that one, but this one. Okay, so here we've got the crane. If you right click on this guy and go to dynamic components, it gives you some options. And one of the options you could control is the hook height. We can put that down hit apply and it automatically updates. We could control the length of the jib, maybe make it a bit longer, and tower height, we could drop that down to 109 feet. We can control the, the rotation of the crane. Right now it's at zero, maybe we want to go to 90 degrees. And we did this because it was 
a common thing on a project where we had to have a construction crane. Uh, there was lots of needs to uh, update that for every project. This gave us a quick way to do that, and uh, we made it available to anyone who wants to um, use it. You'll see that come up a little bit later in, in this model. Uh, back to the other construction logistics. Um, sometimes we don't have a component, and then we need to model from scratch. In this case, the Baker tank is something that we were able to get a spec sheet for, uh, so you can sort of see what that looks like here. We got these schematics for the Baker tank and created an accurate model. The benefit of that is that we now have accurate pieces on the site here to help with planning. These are some uh, different wellheads, and this is their plan for getting uh, water out of the site. Then if we go to the next phase where we've got actual excavation happening, here you see we've got some um, steel sheet shoring that's holding the dirt back. This is a, sort of a representation of what the d different level of, of dirt might look like in the site. We set this up using a, a tool called, um, it's in the sandbox draw from scratch. When you do that, it gives you the ability to make a little, uh, I'll get out here so we can, we can actually do one of these things. So if you draw from scratch, it gives you just a little mesh that you can start and modify. So, little hint, if you need to make terrain in one little spot, it can be a good way to do that. So let's go back to where we were here in the excavation phase. These guys, also equipment, what we will commonly do is we found these in the 3D warehouse actually as a complete component. We adjusted them to remove a lot of the detail. Sometimes we have to put in a lot of equipment into the models. And if you've got 30, 40 different components and they're all running five megabytes each, you're quickly gonna exceed SketchUp's limit to uh, be able to deal with um, all of the geometry. So we generally try to keep these things real simple, stripped down components. And I'm gonna talk about one other item related to components and equipment. And that is not really a piece of equipment, but more of a wayfinding issue. That you see these arrows here. Um, arrows are, can be a useful tool to explain the way that things are moving. And if you don't have the actual trucks themselves animated moving through the model, the arrows can help people understand what's going to happen. It is um, always a, a choice for us. Do we put those arrows in the SketchUp model itself? or do we add them later in post-processing? And in this case, because we knew we were gonna be wanting to look at some different angles, we decided to go ahead and put the arrows in so that they'll always be at the appropriate perspective. If you add the arrows in post-processing over top of a SketchUp image, and you decide to change your camera angle later, you'll have to redraw the arrows. Okay. So you can see now that as we move up through the tower, we've got different light levels of um, the tower moving up. And this is five, four, three. So one thing I want to talk about here is organizing the model to allow uh, a, a showing of sort of sequential, um, you know, a sequence in, in the, what, how things are going to get built. And there's a couple ways to do that. One way is to have items that are showing up and made visible or invisible based on what layer they're on. And we're using that strategy to deal with all the equipment. Each of these different phases has equipment in different places. So they're all in the model, but they're on different layers. So all this equipment, you can see here, this component is on the uh, layer three logistics here and that's meant to go with the third step, which is excavation. If I were to turn on layer four uh, logistics, that's not gonna fit. That's supposed to, that's actually going with this scene here. And so you can see the logistics that we added in this scene. Here's the, the layer five logistics. 
that one is, we wanted it in multiple scenes, so I guess we, we wanted that visible whenever the crane was there. This is layer six, seven, and eight. So we had these different items of logistics that were showing up in different scenes. And the good thing about that is that it does allow you to nest objects inside of groups and still control the, the visibility. If you were to go into your scenes window and look at the options you have when creating a, a scene, you'll see that there's all these different properties that can be saved. We're using the visible layers property here, but we're not saving the hidden geometry information in this scene. Hidden geometry is another way to handle whether something's visible or invisible. And you know, certainly you could hide that whole item and then save that information so that it would, that scene would remember whether that should be visible or, or not. And the downside of that approach is as soon as you start working with items that are nested inside of groups, so if I were to go into here and then I decided I wanted to hide this object, it's inside a group, I could go ahead and hide it now, but the um, scene tab, the scene window wouldn't remember anything that's below the top layer of objects or components in the model. So that's one thing, the layers allows us to, um, to deal with that issue. And there's um, one thing I should mention related to that, when you start making a lot of layers to, um, so start, as soon as you start using a lot of layers to manage visibility, you're gonna come along later on in the process and realize that you wanna add something. So let's say for argu sake of argument, you wanted to add a little uh, turret up here. I'm gonna make this a group and I'll make it kind of an um, orange color just to make sure it stands out real well. And then let's say this needs to be on a new, a new layer, and we'll call that layer uh, 4A. So what you'll notice here is that that new layer just got added to every single scene, but maybe I really only wanted it in 4. And so that's a problem that there's a plugin to solve. It's like, it's like everything in SketchUp. There's always a plugin to solve that issue. And um, the plugin that uh, we can use, there's one we've used forever called Add Hidden Layer, but uh, that's not, that one's not in the extension warehouse that I know of. So um, I checked for one that it just, just works just as well. And I'll show you how that is set up. Let me get rid of this layer that I just made. That's here. We're gonna delete layer 4A. And let's go through the same situation again, but using this extension called Auto Invisible Layer. And we can say, turn that functionality on so that now every time we create a new layer, its default behavior will be invisible to every scene. So we're gonna create a new layer by giving it a layer here in the info window. And now you'll see, if we go into each scene, that layer is invisible by default. So what we would do is say, if we wanted it on this particular scene, we could go and make it visible, go into that scene, and just update only the visible layers property. So now you see that it shows up in that scene only. So it's a handy tool if you've got dozens of scenes in a model and you want to have something show up in only just one of those. But for now, let's go ahead and get rid of that layer. And I'm going to move on to a, a different way of managing visibility, and that is by using uh, section cuts. And in this particular project, we um, had an interest in showing the building at different stages of completion and what would the logistics look on site, uh, what would they look like at different stages of completion. This building, we didn't have a strong need to change the geometry of the building, we just wanted to change how much is going to show up. And so I'm going to let us, let's, go, let's make the uh, section planes visible here. So you can sort of see what's happening here. 
at this layer, we've got two items in the building that are um, being controlled by section plane. There's this one out here. This section plane is controlling the visibility of the structure. And then we've got another section plane. This one is controlling the visibility of the skin. And the skin is sort of the blue, transparent uh, outside. Just a little uh, digression. A lot of times when we work on projects like this, the level of the um, design is not that far along. You saw with the conceptual um, design documents that I showed you, now they hadn't gotten into exactly what the skin of this building is going to look like. And so we just needed to have something there that was um, indicating that there is going to be a skin on this building and what stage of completion it would be in without getting into the details of what, what it was going to be. And that's really important for a construction company. They don't want to um, purport to be the design experts. They, they, they're, they're talking about construction. Uh, they don't want to out-design the architect. So you can see there's a, several states uh, set for this, for this um, building. We've got the, each of these different section planes that we can, in turn, make active. And when we make a different section plane active, for example, who wanted to make this, this plane active, you can right click and say active cut. And now you can see the level of the structure jumped up to there. Uh, by the same token, I could go into here and make this plane active. And the skin's now jumped up to there. So that's the, the uh, system that we use to control the visibility of the, of the building. And then you can see, let me show you how that ends up working out when we set up the layers. Uh, let's go and view, hide the section planes. And you can see we have these different stages set up. And if you look at the scenes that we've set up and the, the different properties that are saved for each scene, you can see for these first few, we're saving just the camera location and the visible layers properties. And then when we get to building the tower, we've got some of the information about the section planes saved in the properties as well. And that's what allows this um, kind of jumping up through the um, levels of the building. If we had chosen to do the building management using layers, we would have had to have four or five different versions of the building, which for just a couple pieces of legit construction equipment, it's no big deal. But when you start thinking about how much geometry is in this and then multiplying that by four, uh, it, it seemed like it would be the right choice to, to use the section plane feature to manage it. And uh, there's one more little perk, which I'll get to in a minute, that the section um, plane strategy allowed us to, uh, to take advantage of. So that's, uh, that's it for logistics and phasing and, and layer management. Now I want to talk a little bit about presentation, presentation strategies. And let's, let's move back out to the, the full model here and talk a little bit about materials and edges and style. In this case, the, we weren't planning to do any post-production processing or rendering to any of these images. So pretty much what you see on screen in SketchUp is how it was going to be presented to the client. And because we have a fair amount of context modeled, we wanted to keep the focus on the area immediately surrounding the construction site. And these buildings, you can see they, because we brought them in from Google Earth, there's more detail in these buildings than we would typically model from scratch. So we made a decision to hide all the edges on these buildings just to help them fade into the background a little bit. And then we've got this building that's going to be demolished, kind of a red color. The, uh, on the base plane, we've got some green for park area and a dark gray for the streets and a blue for the river. And what else about rendering?
one of the advantages of sticking with a presentation style that works just out of SketchUp is that you can have immediate results. You don't need to go and, and, and render something to get a nice looking result for the client. And when they um, present this, a lot of times they'll just present it straight out of SketchUp, which means they might have a set of slides to go through, but at any point they can choose to stop and zoom in on a particular area to, for clarification. If I was presenting, you know, I might even go as far as to say, well, we're going we're gonna to move equipment around during the presentation. Just depends on the level of uh, comfort and expertise with the, the folks who are using it. But one thing I think I've always liked about SketchUp is it's a program that's not super expensive or terribly hard to learn. So we can create complex models for our clients knowing that they'll be able to uh, open and use those for their presentations. So let's talk a little bit about camera view now. Um, this is an issue of, that I think a lot about as we're getting ready to present. What should the camera angle be to capture both the issue that's being described and the context, enough context to make sure people understand what they're looking at. So let's take the dewatering, for example. Um, if we had stuck with a kind of a wide camera angle for this shot, we're going to lose a little bit of information about what's happening here with these wellheads. It's just too small. So that's one reason to zoom in close for this shot so we can see enough of these wellheads to describe what's happening, but not um, totally lose the context. So that's this, that's this particular view that we chose for that. For the excavation, we needed to show a little bit more of the context to explain how the trucks were going to be entering and exiting the site. And so that was the reason to pull back a little bit. Then as we get into the tower views, you can see that we're changing position of the camera to be able to fit all of the tower on screen at the same time. Now, there's an important thing about context is it's not only the context of, of what exists around the site, it's also the context of what happened before and after. You've got a sequence and you want to make sure that people can relate to where the camera was and where, and where it is now and not get totally lost. If I were to go from here and the next camera angle is up here, people might not necessarily be able to make that jump in their heads. So you can see that the angles we've chose, we try to make sure that the, the camera angles are um, close enough that you can kind of relate a little bit. You know, here we're zooming in and turning slightly. Here we've just moved the camera down a little bit. And this would probably be a good time to actually turn on the, the scene animation because it really it illustrates what we were, what, I, what I'm talking about. Let me go into model info and turn on enable scenes transitions. So you can see here that the camera angles, they do relate pretty well to one another. Here we're, where we've rotated, you can see that rotation in the camera animation. But it is important, particularly if you're only going to be using still images in the presentation, to try to make the sequence make sense one after another. So I mentioned before there was, an, there was a second reason we use the, the section cut tool. And that is that it allowed us to do something kind of fun with the building itself. Not only does the camera angle uh, transition have a SketchUp animation associated with it, but also the active section planes transition has a camera angle, I mean, has a transition associated with it. So you can see when we click between scenes that active section plane is also animating along with the camera angle. So it's a nice bit of eye candy um, and sort of helps a little bit with understanding. The uh, other things that you can animate with a transition that I'm not showing here is um, shadows. So if there was a shadow set up for a couple different times of day, we could 
go ahead and set that as a, another, um, another option to animate. And it's neat for doing shadow studies and that sort of thing. One other thing I wanted to show was how to use keyboard shortcuts to toggle between different scenes. One of the things that I run into is when I'm presenting a model that has a lot of scenes, this one just has eight or, or nine scenes to show, but you might have 16, 24 scenes and be presenting from a laptop that has a much smaller screen. So these, these scene tabs are gonna be off the window. And in order to select all the different scenes, you know, certainly I could open the scenes window and, and go through and, and select scenes sequentially. But sometimes it's nice to have a quicker uh, way to do it without having that window open. And if you go into the SketchUp's preferences, you have an option to set keyboard shortcuts. So that would be a way you go into the camera menu and you scroll down to um, the scenes. Is it? Okay, it's not camera, it's view. So view, animation, previous scene, and next scene. So I can set a keyboard shortcut for those two items. And I will do that here with an option left arrow for previous scene and an option right arrow for next scene. And we'll go ahead and close that up. And so now I can just say move to the next scene by clicking those keyboard shortcuts. And even if I didn't have these open, let's say I can close all these up just to have a nice clean view here. Now we're going to go backwards. And I could still go up here and you know, click to a particular scene and then go, come back to these when I'm going back to the presentation. Um, almost as nice as working in a slide presentation with your previous and next button. And then the, uh, the last thing to mention on, on animation and presentation is that there will be times when you don't want to present from SketchUp for a variety of reasons. And in that case, you're going to be exporting clips or still images from the model. And if you have, here I have nine, and I certainly could go and for each of these scenes export a 2D graphic and, you know, and then you know, put it in the still and repeat that nine times. But it does get to be time consuming. And one little trick that we've come up with is to actually export an animation, but set up the animation so that there's just one still for every scene instead of exporting all of the transitions between the scenes. So the way we handle that is you go into your model info window and just disable that scene transition option and then set up one other thing you, you do have to do, I almost forgot. You want to go into your scenes window and look at which scenes are set up to be part of the animation. So here I've got these other scenes that we're not using as part of the export. And then I've got nine scenes that are set up to include in the animation. So with that set up, I can now go into the um, export animation. And probably the, you know, the default might be compressed with H.264 for a, a, you know, a movie or a, uh, where you're actually showing the transitions. We're just going to do JPEG images, individual images. We'll save them in that stills folder. I'll say we're going to call it phase something. And then the SketchUp will number it automatically. And for the options, I can choose what size I want each of these to be. And we'll set a custom size. One thing that I've noticed uh, that can be a little bit buggy, so I'll, I'm not sure if it's work being an issue on here, but we've seen it on other computers. Uh, is that it can be sometimes hard to get these two numbers to uh, set up the correct way. Um, like, like maybe it thinks it still wants to be 16 by 9 even when you set it up for custom. So if you run into that issue, we've seen it on Mac. Um, this is my little uh, shout out to SketchUp team to take a look at this. But if you run into an issue where you have a hard time getting these width and height numbers to square for you to be what you want them to do. Our little trick is we can, you can preview the print. Oh, did you see how that changed to 720? Very strange. Um, so I want this to be 1600. And then, and then before you click out of this field, hit preview frame size. And then don't touch anything else. And then hit OK. 
and, uh, and then hopefully that'll solve that issue for you. Um, we don't want to loop to the starting scene. We're just going to have one anti-alias export for each scene. So we'll hit OK and then export into that stills folder. And you can see now it's going through for each of the frames and giving us one still image for each scene. And we'll take a look at what that turned out to be. Here they are, each of those stills. If we open that, you can see we've got them all set up in here. Much faster than doing each one individually. And that concludes the demo. I hope you enjoyed watching. Thank you for your interest. And by all means, uh, if you'd like to see more of our construction work, um, just head over to fatpencilstudio.com and take a look at our portfolio of, of different work. Be happy to hear from you. Thanks.